Hello, everyone, and thank you all for coming today to our panel discussion. On behalf of the sponsors of this event, the Stanford King Center on Global Development, the King International Development Association, and the Business Association of Stanford Entrepreneurial Students, I want to say a quick introduction and a very warm welcome to today's panelists, Dr. Deepak Chopra and Sophia Kiani. Dr. Chopra is a world-renowned pioneer in integrative medicine and personal transformation. He is the founder of the Chopra Foundation, a nonprofit researching well-being and humanitarianism, as well as Chopra Global, a modern-day health company at the intersection of science and spirituality. Chopra is also a clinical professor of family medicine and public health at the University of California, San Diego, and serves as a senior scientist with the Gallup Organization. He has authored over 90 books that have been translated into over 43 languages, including numerous New York Times bestsellers. And Time Magazine has described him as one of their top 100 most influential people. We sincerely thank Dr. Chopra for being here with us today. Sophia Kiani is an Iranian-American climate activist studying science, technology, and society here at Stanford. She's the founder and executive director of Climate Cardinals, an international nonprofit with 9,000 volunteers in over 40 countries working to translate climate information into over 100 languages. She is the youngest person ever to serve as an advisor for the United Nations and has also sat on boards and advisory councils for the New York Times, the World Economic Forum, Web Summit, Environmental Media Association, Inkey List, Ashoka, American Lung Association, and Born This Way Foundation. Please join me in welcoming today's panelists for our discussion. Thank you guys so much for coming. I'm really excited for this conversation because I think increasingly in the climate landscape, fostering intergenerational dialogue is really crucial to ensuring we can further our impact. So I, I would love if you could start. I know you have a framework through which you, you look at this, and I, I'd love if you could share it with everyone. OK. First of all, thank you. Thank you also, Sophia. It's wonderful to be with all of you every time I speak to your generation. I feel guilty about what we've done. So thank you for being here. I think climate change is connected to everything that has to do with our physical, mental, social, economic well-being. and. Uh, Unfortunately, we are, st as you know, politically still in denial uh, in many parts of this country and the world. But if you're in New York City anytime and you're walking uh, in Union Square, you'll see a, a countdown uh, that says about less than seven years before we start having major catastrophes, major catastrophes. Uh, sinking of marshlands, some islands, um, mass pandemics, mass migrations, violence, fall of governments, and disease. This is there. You see the countdown every second. We have seven years or less. And so the vast majority of people, other than the kind of work you're doing in your interests are still in denial. And if we continue to stay in this denial, we are sleepwalking to extinction. The last extinction was 65 million years ago when uh, a meteorite fell on our planet somewhere in Yucatan. And within a few days, the dominant species on this planet was wiped out, dinosaurs. Amazing species, all kinds of variations in that species, but they were wiped out. And we emerged. So if you're not careful, <laughs> nature might be saying the human experiment was interesting, but it didn't work. And something better will emerge. You know, We are just one small planet somewhere in what I would say now is the junkyard of infinity. There are two trillion galaxies, according to current scientific estimates, 700 sextillion stars. I don't even know how to write that. Mm -hmm. okay? 
trillions of planets, trillions of planets. Current science says there might be 60 billion habitable planets in just the Milky Way galaxy. 60 billion habitable planets similar to ours. Multiply that by 2 trillion galaxies. So the number of planets is incomprehensible. Now, how do scientists estimate this? They look at what is called a biosphere, something that's similar to ours. If it's too hot, no life as we know it. If it's too cold, no life as we know it. And there are other things like gravitation and temperature and many other factors. But our current science says that we are not alone. So the other day I went to the beach and I picked up one grain of sand, which is what we are in all the beaches mm -hmm. of the world. And a little breeze came and this little speck of dust disappeared and the beach did not notice. Okay, so in the big picture, we're not that important. But in our own ecosystem, that's all we have. Mm. So there are many ways we can tackle climate change and even reverse it. And I'll just enumerate them and then I'll hand it over to you to ask questions and tell me about your work too. So there are at least six strategies that would reverse climate change very effectively. First is pro protecting coastal ecosystems and marshlands and mangroves because the coastal ecosystem ultimately is the origin of all life, you know, the oceans. Even we come from the ocean. Coastal ecosystems buffer storms. They act as natural filtration systems. They harbor life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's clearly understood that that would be an effective strategy. The second would be what is called agroforestry, combining forestry with agriculture, permaculture, as they call it rotating the crops, et cetera, but making sure that the ecosystem of agroforestry nurtures life, human life, but also animal life, plant life, and marine life, and trees, and so on. The third strategy would be distributed uh, energy systems with clean energy, but distribution, because centralized energy plants, if there's a catastrophe, everything is destroyed. If they're distributed, the damage is less. The next strategy would be uh, mass transportation with clean energy. And the final thing would be decreasing our meat consumption because that's, that's the major cause of greenhouse gases on this planet. So why aren't we doing it? We are not doing it because we don't have a proper understanding of what we call the environment, and we don't have an emotional and spiritual relationship with what we call the world. So I'll stop there. I'll ask you about what you're doing and share uh, with us the work you're doing and what you want to achieve with your generation, and then we'll go back and forth. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I appreciate the framework that you listed because I think often, especially young people, are looking at this crisis that you said we didn't cause, and we're looking at how can we how can we take action, what can we do about it, and looking at it through frameworks, I think, provides people with a starting point for here are the various issues that have been laid out to us, like where am I best positioned to make an impact, and I think that was what I did when I first became increasingly alarmed about the state of the climate crisis and, and the ills that we're facing our planet. And I decided to start my nonprofit, Climate Cardinals, because I realized what I was really passionate about was education. And I thought one of the ways that I could make a difference was by translating climate education into as many languages as possible, now over 100, in an effort to get people, get the world to pay attention. And something I really appreciated that you said was about relearning about our relationship with the planet. And, and that was a question I really had for you, is one of the biggest issues that I've seen facing myself, my peers, is the, the tragedy of eco-anxiety, where increasingly 
seeing the state of the planet, seeing the state of our world is having a detrimental impact on the mental health of young people. So I'd love to hear more about what you think, uh, how we have a relationship with the planet as well as our own spirituality and mental health, and, and kind of if you have any recommendations for young people about actionable things they can do to improve their relationship with, with the world. So let's talk, first of all, amazing, the work you're doing, and congratulations. And I hope more and more people get involved in this kind of work because, unfortunately, it's up to your generation now. We've got, got, caused the damage, and you have to fix it. So let's talk a little bit about the mental health crisis also. At this moment, as we speak, suicide is the second most common cause of death amongst young people. Second most common cause of death. The first is accidents and drugs. The second, which is related to mental illness as well. People don't normally take drugs or have accidents unless they're already in distress or some kind of distress. The second most common cause of death is suicide. And every 40 seconds, somebody in the world is dying from suicide, and mostly young people people even younger than yourselves, but your age as well. So when I became aware of this, and our foundation became aware of this, we started to see how we could tackle this and scale it. So we created an emotional AI chatbot, and her name is Piwi, P-I-W-I, was the name of an English recording artist, English-French recording artist, who died from suicide. Her sister is a film actress. Uh, she's uh, British, French, Mauritius, Indian, etc. And she became an activist in suicide prevention. So we called the chatbot PV. That was the name of her sister. But PV now is an acronym for personal intervention with intention, mm. personal intervention with intention. PV was launched less than, less than a year and a half ago, and she has now intervened in 6,000 suicide ideations. She's talking to 20 million people simultaneously. If you want to check her out, either personally or out of curiosity, the, you can go to www.neveralone.love. Mm. Once again, www.neveralone.love, and she'll be there. You'll find her there, amongst other things. And you can make friends with her. And she gets to know you. And uh, young people your age and, and teens are more comfortable talking to PV than to a human being, another reflection of our times, mm. that people are more comfortable taking talking to a machine than to a human being. And the reason is they don't feel judged. She feels, she feels totally comfortable with whatever you say to her. And she's private. She doesn't have your conversation with another person. And she checks on you. She wants to know how your day went, who your friends are, did you have a nice restful night, what your relationships are like, are you exercising, et cetera, et cetera. And the way PV works and Never Alone works is through what we call the four A's. So the first A is attention, deep listening. The second A is affection, deep caring. Third A is appreciation, deep gratitude for the uniqueness of everyone. And the fourth is acceptance, radical acceptance of people just as they are. So these four A's, we are creating an ecosystem worldwide where people never feel alone. Because that's the crisis of our age. The crisis of our age is we are lonely even though we think we are connected. We, you know, on social media, we are connected, but in a strange way. We have sacrificed ourselves for our selfies. <laughs> and so that's all that matters to people. They don't know the difference between who they are and their selfie. 
and they want validation. How many likes, how many dislikes? And of course, as you know, there's a lot of bullying on social media, which adds to the crisis. So we are now in a phase where we are actually um, scaling PV into other languages, because this is a global crisis. So we're going to do PV in Farsi, in Arabic, in Hindi, in Urdu, and in many of the Eastern European languages as well. That's a very practical intervention. We also recognize that a lot of people can't afford counseling if they need it. And some people need counseling. So we have counselors at the back end. And now with the movement in crypto and blockchain, we'll be able to pay for everyone that needs a counselor. That's one intervention. But you asked about the spiritual dimension of this. And the spiritual dimension is, unless you're emotionally and spiritually involved in something, and this is unfortunately where science is, it's all about facts, but there's no emotional engagement, there's no spiritual engagement. And partly because of the way we do science is we are very reductionist. There's me and there's everybody else. So this is our perception of ourselves. There's me and then there's you, there's you, and there's this big world and then the universe. And that kind of thinking has actually led to the crisis, has led to the crisis. If you look at, and I didn't mention restoration of indigenous people's rights as a very important part of climate change reversal. Because indigenous people, who, by the way, indigenous people live on 50% of our planet close to nature. They don't see the world out there as the environment. For them, those trees are your lungs. For them, this air is your breath. For them, the soil is recycling as your body. For them, the oceans and rivers are your circulation. We can do a little meditation to get that experience at the end if you want. But the word me and the rest of the world or environment is totally alienating and not true. We are not separate from all of this. But in fact, this is a product of all of this. And I mentioned earlier that when people look for life on other planets, they look for a biosphere. Your body is a biosphere. Yeah. And this biosphere and this are entangled. They're one. You put a rabbit in a vacuum, it dies. You put a plant in a vacuum, it dies. You put them both together, and they both thrive. Okay, they both live. So this is, in, in Buddhist philosophies, this is called interdependent co-arising. In fact, a very famous expression from Thich Nhat Hanh, we are inter-beings in the inter-isness. That's who we are as individuals. We are part of a matrix of consciousness that is expressing itself through species. And each species has its own universe, depending on its nervous system. So what you see out there is not the real world. This is a species-specific human projection. What does this world look like, look like to an insect with 100 eyes? What does this world experience to a bat that hears the world through the echo of ultrasound? What does this world look like to a chameleon whose eyeballs swivel on two different axes? You can't even remotely imagine what this room would look like to a chameleon. So what is the real picture of the world? The answer is there's no such thing. The world is a projection of our collective consciousness. And it is a projection. This is a species-specific projection with leaky margins. Because when we destroy other species, we end up destroying ourselves as well. That spiritual, emotional shift is necessary. Now, in social sciences, there's something called emergence. There's an idea called emergence. Emergence is when the old story dies, the story we created with the reductionist science, and a new story is born. That means old relationships or the old way of dealing with relationships die. We don't relate in the old way, me and the other. You know, 
you've heard the African expression, Ubuntu. I am because you are. Mm. And you are because I am. And so the old meanings, the old context, the old relationships, the old story has to totally die and a new story has to be born. A death and a resurrection. And it has to be a complete creative expression. Death is ultimate creativity, which means the old story is no longer relevant. And then a new story is born. New context, new meaning, new relationships, new story. And for that, we need, social, according to social science, you need maximum diversity. As I sit in this room, I see maximum diversity. Race, gender, but also maximum diversity in education, not just the humanities and the sciences, but maximum diversity in understanding our new technologies, disruptive as they are, AI, and all the new technologies that are emerging, but also maximum diversity of storytellers, of songwriters, of movie makers. When you bring entertainment, storytelling, poetry, music, maximum diversity, leveraging everybody's strengths and an emotional and spiritual bond, then something new happens. And you don't even know what that story will be, but it will be a new story. So you are the new storytellers. I love that you said that because something I often say to my friends is that every major can be a climate major. And I, I'm studying science, technology, and society at Stanford because I wanted to do something that was interdisciplinary. I wanted to take as many courses as possible. And I, I look at my friends at Stanford and they're all taking so many different classes. My friends who are in computer science and engineering, well, they can use their skills to determine how can we leverage AI, for example, to make an impact. And then my friends who are studying things that are more creative, like fashion, like theater, they can look at how can we leverage the arts to raise awareness. And I, I think another point that you made that I really appreciated was also that so much of this work can become pointing fingers. Who is to blame? Who is responsible? Instead of realizing that that, again, fosters that culture of competitiveness, that, pol that the culture of hate that I think is also partially responsible for why we are in the situation that we are. When you said we are just a tiny speck it made me think also that everyone has to start with something, right? We start with one tiny speck, we start with one first step, and that can turn into one voice becoming an entire chorus of people taking action one by one. Um, and given that we are at Stanford, in, in the heart of Silicon Valley, I also think it's important to think about what role can technology play, what role can innovation play, in furthering climate solutions. I know that that's something I've been working a lot on, thinking about how we can leverage tech to actually work on sustainable fashion solutions uh, with one of my directors for Climate Cardinals here. And I, I'd love to hear your perspective as well for how do you think that young people, how do you think the students here can leverage their educations, their tools to make an impact, especially when it comes to issues like climate? They're all related. Climate, the fashion industry, you know, there's no such thing right now as clean fashion, as you know. <laughs> and so that needs to emerge. But here is something that I think is very practical. And I'm not doing this out of uh, a need to sell anybody anything. But uh, I have been working with Gallup. You're familiar with Gallup, the organization that does polls, etc. So Gallup is one of the few organizations that looks at uh, what we call world well-being mm. and world happiness and world satisfaction and health. And we measure and quantify well-being in several areas. So there's one thing we call corporate well-being. So what creates a healthy corporation or a business? And we have a lot of data on how a leader in a corporation, if he or she encourages what we said, maximum diversity, and complementing everyone's strengths, because see the, the number of strengths in this room alone. Okay, we look, I just have to look at the, everybody's 
ethnic ethnicity and I can see that you know you're all different people but yet you all represent the total universe you represent the total universe your body 20 million genes are not even human they're coming from the soil you have only 25,000 human genes but you have 22 million to 20 million bacterial genes which are most of the genetic information in your body is not even human. It comes from the soil. And if you destroy that soil, you're causing inflammation in your body. In fact, dysbiosis or inflammation of the microbiome is now considered the number one cause of every chronic disease that human beings have. 30% of the microbiome, the genetic information in the soil, has gone from urban Areas. So if you go to New York City or, or San Francisco, 30% of the genetic information on this planet, which is necessary for our survival, is missing. You go in the Amazon, you take one teaspoon of soil, one teaspoon of soil from under the ground, it has more genetic diversity than the entire surface of the planet, including the rainforest. So the gold mine of life is the soil. And if we could resurrect even that, if we could resurrect the microbiome, it would drastically change our health, our longevity, our disease patterns, and also affect the ecosystem because this biosphere and that biosphere is the same. Resurrecting planetary soil, which is the source of all life, including marine life. Okay, it's part of the same ecosystem. But the point here is, how can technology play a role? You know, how can technology play a role? And, you know, we, or everybody's now very fearful of technology with chat, GPT, and all the, there's a new one coming called Prometheus from Microsoft. I have access to all these. And if you actually ask even AI systems, what's the best way to resurrect life on this planet. You'll get a lot of information, by the way. But you'll also get a lot of misinformation because technology also represents the collective human mm -hmm. mind, you know, which is both divine and diabolical. We've created through technology cyber warfare, biological weapons, nuclear weapons. Uh, somebody can sit in some remote part of the world and interfere with elections in supposedly the most powerful country in the world. And, you know, you need one accident to have a catastrophe. So there is a very diabolical aspect to technology, but there's also something very divine about technology. And you should understand that technology is part of our evolution. If you say, stop technology, then evolution dictates that you'll be irrelevant. So we have to accept technology, but we also have to make sure that it represents our impulse for healing. It represents our impulse for compassion. It represents our impulse for joy. There's no joy in the world. You know, I, I go to universities and everybody's struggling so hard, you know, preparing for exams, hard work, exacting plans, discipline, and then entrepreneurship with exit strategies. I meet young entrepreneurs. Before they tell me what they're doing, they're telling me what their exit strategy is. And, you know, and they never think that the final exit is death. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you want to go to your final exit saying, I had so many startups and I did this, this, and this, but I never experienced joy? If you don't have joy in your life, then you missed the point of life. You know, all you have to do is look at a baby to see that the baby is joyful for no reason, full of curiosity, full of wonder, full of compassion, trying to look you into the eyes, and as soon as you lock in the eyes, big smile, that's our state, original state, and we've lost it. So using technology, not only to cure depression, but to actually create joy, to create well-being, to harbor this natural impulse that we have for empathy, which means we feel what others feel and compassion, the desire to alleviate suffering, 
without empathy and compassion, even good service will not make any difference. You need both love and action. Love without action is irrelevant. It's meaningless. It's melodrama. And action without love is also irrelevant. But when you have love in action, you can heal the world. And you start with yourself. And you use technology wisely. I love all of that because, especially when we're talking about issues like climate change, it becomes very easy to get stuck in a cycle of doom and gloom when we're faced with, with looking at the crisis that we have created. And I, I think for us as students, or at least I can speak for myself, there also is a notion of, of a culture of competition that is created when you're constantly looking for the next big thing, you're constantly existing within these systems that force us to point fingers at one another and to place blame. And uh, uh, something someone said to me recently that really stuck with me was, by yourself you can go far, but with others you can go further. And that's a big theme that I want to, to stick on because I think it's of consequence that this is, of course, the new young generation. And there's so much that we can do to learn from one another, to foster intergenerational dialogue. And I'd love to hear your perspective on that, as well as if you have any advice for young people to help, help us make the decisions that are ultimately going to, to uh, shape our future and also the future of, of the world. Well, we're having an intergenerational dialogue mm -hmm. right now. But I would say don't depend on my generation. Mm -hmm. When you want to see a drastic new story, it's going to be one funeral at a time. My generation has to become irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, we blame ourselves and blame our generation. But you also have to remember that everything we do comes from our state of awareness. So, we did the best we could mm -hmm. from what we knew when we knew what we knew. So, you know, when you do the best you can and you're not even aware of the larger picture, then you cause this. I grew up in the 60s. I went to medical school in 1964. And I thought in a few years, the world was going to change. We had started, you know, my generation was the first generation to experiment with uh, LSD and, uh, and all the, you know, things that are coming back right now. My generation at that time in the 60s saw the women's rights movement, you know, while I was in medical school, uh, the feminist movement was, uh, uh, was emerging, Gloria Steinem in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and my generation saw the emergence of Greenpeace, the anti-war movement in Vietnam. So in my 20s, when I was your age, I thought, hey, a few years and the world will be different. Mm -hmm. Then we grew up and we became like everyone else. You know, Money became the most important currency for importance and for prestige. And, you know, a long time ago, I heard a song by Bob Marley. Some people are so poor, all they have is money. Mm. When, you look at, when you look at what creates happiness or contentment, people, here's what we know is an accepted happiness formula. And I'd love for you to actually imbibe this. So the happiness equation is H is equal to S plus C plus V. Can you remember that? Happiness, H, is equal to S plus C plus V. S stands for set point in the brain. 50% of your daily happiness experience comes from your set point in the brain. So what is that? Happy people, are you happy? Yeah. Contented? Happy people, see opportunity when there is adversity. Mm. So that's the only difference between happy people and unhappy people. Unhappy people right now would look at climate change and say we are doomed, which you mentioned. Happy people will say what is the opportunity and what can I do about it? 50% of your happiness comes from just your set point. So that's S plus C. C stands for conditions of living, 
primarily money. 10% of your happiness, or 12%, comes from how much money you make or how much money you have. So if you win the lottery today, and you're earning, say, $50,000 a year or 100000 suddenly you make $20 million, you'll be ecstatic in the beginning. Six months, you'll plateau. and one year, you'll be back to your set point. Okay, so in one year, you'll be as happy or unhappy as you were before you won the lottery. And in about two, three years or five years, you'll be unhappy because now you're thinking about your taxes and where you want to park your money in the Bahamas and all that ridiculous thing that rich people do. <laughs> so 10%. Then there's 40% left. And that comes from our daily choices. The choices, that's V, voluntary choices. S plus C plus V, voluntary. There are two kinds of choices we make every day, two kinds of choices. One is for personal pleasure. The most common choice people make for personal pleasure in the world today is shopping. That's why we call each other consumers, an ugly word to describe stardust beings, which we really are with self-awareness. Shopping is the number one cause of people making choices, thinking they'll be happy. Others include alcohol, drugs, sex, etc. But do those choices make us happy? Yes, they do, but only for a short period. So you buy a new car, and then you, six months later, you want another one. You buy a new iPhone, and you know, then 13 is not good enough, 14 is better. So it doesn't give you what is called contentment. So the second choice is, how do you find contentment? Joy. And that comes from two things. One is, you have meaning and purpose in your life and you know your strengths. And the second is you know how to make other people happy. Actually, the fastest way to be happy is to make somebody else happy. And that involves the four A's that I mentioned, attention, affection, appreciation, and acceptance. That's what is now called the happiness formula. I want you to remember that as you embark on your life's journey after you finish, because you know life is, for most people, it's a struggle because they don't know why they're doing what they're doing. So it's, you want this enterprise, you want this business, you want this job, why? What are you going to achieve? What is the meaning behind it? What is your purpose? Will it bring you joy? Will it increase your ability to make other people happy? You should start with that. One thing that I did, mention, did not mention when I was speaking about Gallup, and this is something you might want to consider for yourself, at Gallup, we have identified 35 strengths that human beings have, 35. And no two people on the planet have the same strengths, five strengths, in the same order. So my strengths are the following five in this order. I'm strategic, number one. I'm futuristic, number two. I'm adaptable, number three. I like to connect people, number four. And I maximize my potential and the potential of others. Now, there might, you might have the same strengths, but not in the same order. Mm -hmm. So now, if you understand this, and you, know, this, you can do this test to find your strengths. It costs about $15, $20, I believe. And you will find your strengths in this order. And if you want to create a business or a team or whatever, then what you do is you create a team around you that has all the 35 strengths. Mm -hmm. Okay, You start with seven people that you can create a team with. And they multiplied by five, you cover all the 35 strengths. And that's a very effective team. And then they in turn, can create their own teams. You know, I've done this with corporations where we've taken the whole business and created an ecosystem of leadership. We call it the soul of leadership, which is based on the acronym leaders. L stands for look and listen. E stands for emotional engagement and empowerment. A stands for awareness, intuition, creativity, higher consciousness, transcendence. D stands for D dream and do it. The next E stands for empowerment. R stands for responsibility. 
and then S stands for synchronicity or meaningful coincidences. So this is a right now meaningful coincidence. And something will emerge out of this. Maybe one person will have a dream that they can fulfill. So check it out, the strength finders on Gallup if you, if you want to. And you know we now have data that shows that well-being actually is the number one predictor of your future, but also the future of the world. And that includes corporate well-being, social well-being, physical well-being, community well-being, and financial well-being. All of them are intimately related. And if you measure well-being, you can predict what's going to happen in the future. So at Gallup, we were able to predict the Arab Spring. We were able to predict <coughs> the fall of Libya and so on, just based on well-being in those countries. Right now, the United States somewhere 16 to 20 in well-being. Scandinavian countries are ahead of us. Uh, you know, Norway and Denmark, etc., and some Eastern countries as well, Bhutan, etc. My my grandma told me recently, you're too young to feel like you're running out of time, which I really resonated with because at a school like Stanford, it's easy to get caught in the rat race and to question why it is you're doing what you're doing and what it is that you want to do with your life. And that's important to me because it's important to realize we're all just learning. I'm still just a 21-year-old at the very beginning of my journey, and most of you are also at the very beginning of the long, long road that we're going to call life. And in tandem with that, I think we're constantly looking for advice and for guidance on what it is we need to do, what decisions we should make. And my question for you would be, where do you look for answers? You know, I find it a little distressing that in every academic institution I've been to, there's no course on self-awareness. On the one fundamental question, who am I? If I ask you who you are, you'll give me a bio. <laughs> and you know, if I ask somebody else who's older than you, they'll say, go to LinkedIn. That tells me who I am. But that's not who you are. That's your name and there you see your bio. And there is no education on awareness as the most fundamental experience of existence. So there's two things. Okay, there's existence. What is existence? This. This, 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 that. But if you did not have awareness of existence, then there's no knowing of existence, right? Awareness of existence is existence. And if there's no awareness of who I am at the most fundamental level, then I've missed out. So all the knowledge, hard work, exacting plans, rigorous discipline, in the end, what does it lead to? Distress. So unless there, I think we need a resurrection of how we educate our young people, which used to be a tradition in the world. You go read play, how many, any students of philosophy here? <laughs> okay, so read Plato, you know, and Plato when he describes the Republic, he goes through all the systems that we were created 2,500 years ago. And the first thing he says is democracy is the rule of the mob. Now, this is very politically incorrect, right, that I'm saying this. But would you trust a mathematician who knew nothing about mathematics? Would you trust a physicist who wasn't trained in physics? Why do you trust leaders that represent literally the vast majority of people who are totally unaware. Mm -hmm. So he trashed democracy 2,500 years ago. Then he looked at aristocracy, and he trashed that too. He said, you know, it leads to tyranny, which we've seen in countries like Iran itself, right? And many revolutions happen. So his solution was what he called the republic. And he said, you have to train to be a leader. 
and you have to train in philosophy and statesmanship. And you look at some ancient, you know, you look at some ancient leaders in ancient times, including Iran, including India, including Greece. There was this movement towards the training of what he called philosopher statesmen or stateswomen who would actually be qualified to run for election, and that would be the republic. Well, 2,500 years later, we're still medieval, and we have modern capacities. And that is a very dangerous combination, to have a medieval tribal mind, and modern capacities spells disaster. So I would say to you, and to everyone who's possibly listening to this or watching this maybe on YouTube, somebody has to take that responsibility to create in universities, prestigious universities like here, courses on self-awareness. Who am I? What do I want? What am I grateful for? What is my purpose? Am I the changing physical body? Or am I the awareness in which this body is changing? Am I the changing mind? Or am I the awareness in which the mind is changing? Am I the changing personality? Or am I the awareness in which the change, because personality evolves. Sometimes it stops at eight years in men, and then they are ready to run for election. <laughs> I, I, I look at my, my friends who I went to middle school and to high school with, and it's incredible to see just in a few years how much we have grown from going and going to parties together, having no idea what we were doing with our lives. And now we have a slightly better idea of, of what we want to do. And I think and another question that I would have for you is what do you think makes a good leader? How can we become better leaders? How can we take accountability maybe for mistakes that we've made in the past? And how can we grow from them to be better and to inspire the people around us? Good leaders inspire other people, not by what they say, although what they say sometimes is very significant. So when I hear a speech like Martin Luther King Jr. saying, I have a dream, mm -hmm. it's very obvious. It's not a personal dream, right? When Martin Luther King said, I have a dream, he was talking about a collective dream, you know a magnificent dream that would inspire others to go beyond racism and bigotry and hatred and prejudice and fear, because fear is the basis of all our violence. Fear and violence go together. And so, yes, you have to be an inspiring leader to inspire others, but ultimately your life has to inspire others. So, you know, when Mahatma Gandhi was asked, what is your message? He said, my life is my mm -hmm. message. And you know, there's a very interesting story about Mahatma Gandhi that I would like to share with you. I was a few years ago in Durban, South Africa. And uh, <clears throat> I was invited to the house of Mahatma Gandhi's granddaughter, who still lives there. And he had other grandchildren too. But one of his granddaughters lives in Durban, South Africa. So when Gandhi came back from England after getting his law degree, he, he didn't think of himself as Indian. He thought of himself as Af African, which is most of Indians who live in Africa think of themselves as Africans, because they've been there for several generations. But then he was thrown out of a train because he was sitting in a white person's compartment. And in his mind, that sparked the movement for independence in Africa. And he actually wanted Africa's independence. And he befriended somebody in Durban, uh, an African priest, who was actually not only a priest, but he was also a shaman, et cetera, et cetera. His name was John Dubé. And John Dubé had started the African National Congress. And when Gandhi went to him and said, I want to help you liberate Africa, John Dubey said to him, why don't you go to India you know, and liberate India? Because ethnically, you'll be more effective in India. Let me take care of Africa. So they became friends, and he went to India. And Gandhi was more successful because the British were a little more 
less violent, not, not necessarily not violent, but they were easier to treat, uh, to deal with the, the Afrikaners. So in any way, India got liberated in 1947, or 46, 47, yeah, 15th August, 19. So who read Mahatma Gandhi's Experiments with Truth? Martin Luther King Jr. And who read Martin Luther King Jr.'s biography? A man called Nelson Mandela. And who was inspired by Nelson Mandela? A man called Obama. Mm. So you see the connectedness. Mm -hmm. How many people know that story? That the world was transformed and is still being transformed because of two people in Africa. And so when Nelson Mandela was released from prison and became the first president of South Africa, the first thing he did, he went to, with Gandhi's granddaughter, who was there, he went to the high school across the street where John Dubey was living. He went to the grave. And before he cast the first vote for South Africa, he saluted the grave. And he said to the grave of John Dubey, Mr. President, I've come to inform you that Africa is free. That took 90 years, mm -hmm. but it was a dream. And it was also the dream of Martin Luther King and the emergence of Obama. So don't think a per one person can't change the world. Every single movement, every single revolution was started by one person who had a crazy dream, but also we, we build on the people who came before us and we learn from the people who came before us. And that, I think, is the spirit of what every Stanford student achieves. And, and what we strive for is to learn from those who have come before us and, and to be inspired to start the next movements. There are still so many. It's, I think it's easy to forget, or at least I do, that when you talk about luminaries like that, that there are still so many ills that society faces. Yes, we've made so much progress as, as a collective, but there are still so many issues that are facing humanity, whether it be climate change, whether it be racism, that some of the greatest minds and, and people who probably are in this room have to think about what can we do to get out of this problem. And I know I find so much strength, so much hope, and so much inspiration in the young people that I talk to every day and the young people that I get the privilege to work with. Because it's not easy, and it, it is a choice every single day to wake up and to say, I'm going to be positive. In the face of every single struggle we face, all the hard things going on in our world, I'm going to put a smile on my face and try to make the world a better place, one action, one step at a time. And I, I'd love to hear from you. What inspires you? What gives you hope? Why do you wake up every single day and, and do the work that you do? I'm most inspired by children and innocence. What we need is a return to innocence, not more education. Mm. Okay, education is great and gives you power and leverage but the return to simplicity and innocence, the return to joy, the return to relationship, the return to intimacy, the return to vulnerability, the return to healing. It cannot come unless we look at a child. You know, the great Indian poet Tagore, who is also a great philosopher, he said, Every child born is proof that God has not yet given up on human beings. I love that. Well, I think that was the perfect last note to say that I, I think it would be amazing to get people in the room to ask questions. I know I have a lot more, but I'm sure you guys do as well. We have some uh, questions prepared from attendees that I can go through, but I think it also would be nice maybe to hear from one or two people in the audience Absolutely. if you're open to it. Yes, sir. <laughs> you touched for a brief minute on collective consciousness. I was wondering if you could elaborate on how we know, how we can possibly know whether the world has a collective consciousness or individual consciousness, and what sort of scientific methodology or 
experientialism, we would need to know that. So I can only give you my own opinion. Individual consciousness is a download of collective consciousness. So when you're born, you have no idea who you are. Okay? All you know is this. And you're pretty joyful with it, unless you're wet or you're hungry, in which case you say, ah, and your mother feeds you. But otherwise, you have no idea. There's no human construct for race, for gender, for identity. Then you're told, this is your name. This is your ethnicity. This is your race. Not realizing that we all come from Africa. Okay, originally we are all one species. When talk about climate change, the reason you and I or you and I look a little similar, but the reason you and I don't look like her or her is climate. That's all. The whole human race comes from one genetic pool in Africa. Okay, but you're told you're such and such race. This is your economic background. This is your name, this is your country, this is your tribe, and now you're screwed for the rest of your life because you don't know who you are. Mm. So there is no such thing as individual consciousness. This is the, what we call individual consciousness uh, is a human construct, just like money is a human construct. So up until 40,000 years ago, it seems, according to deep historians, there were eight different species of humans. We call ourselves homo sapiens, which, by the way, means the wise ones. So we were humble enough to give ourselves that name. <laughs> okay. Then we gave names to the other species, Neanderthals, Florences, on and on. They all look like you and me, but some were this big, some were this big. They were the same human family, but different species. So just like a cat and a panther and a tiger and a lion and a cheetah, are the same family, but they're different species. We were one species amongst eight or 10 humanoids. And all these species had a language which was very primitive. It was for three things, danger, sex, and, and food. That's how we survive. Food calls, danger calls, and mating calls. That's the language of birds and other animals. Then we, this species, created a language for stories. We, we are the only species that tell stories. Okay, I'm at Stanford, I'm a medical student, I'm this, I'm that. That's a story. So we created a language of stories, and the first language for story was gossip. Who's sleeping with whom, who can be trusted, who can't be trusted. And then quickly other stories, money. It's a story. Okay, there was no such thing. Okay, money, nation states, empires, colonialism, and then on and on, Wall Street, exchanges, trade, commerce, it's all a human story. And we've lost the knowing that everything we know is a human story, including animals, plants, species, is a human story. What's behind that story is collective human consciousness, but what's behind that collective human consciousness is something very primordial. And that primordial is, and this is very Eastern, by the way, so not everybody will accept it, but that is that the fundamental ground of all existence is something called pure consciousness. Pure consciousness means without constructs. And that is creative, that is entangled with everything else, that is the source of our constructs even, and the, the sooner we change our constructs, we change the world. Because the world is a projection of our constructs. Yeah, I'll connect anyone who is interested in connecting with Dr. Chopra. And thank you so much for being so generous with oh, your yeah. time today. I know I learned a lot from you. you. And I'm sure everyone else did as well. I know we're now over time. But I wanted to say thank you so much to everyone for coming today. I know I'm, I'm so grateful that you were we're able to come and, and I hope that all of you took something away from this conversation.